So when I was 16, I found myself standing at the front door of a house that I've actively avoided my whole life thus far. Now, anything cliche you could conjure up about a creepy old abandoned house, you could cut and paste that here about this one. The paint was peeling, windows murky, some have even shattered and simply remained that way. Not only was it the eyesore of our respectable community, but it came with a story that has ruined more than a few nights of sleep for me. So why the fuck was I here, standing on this creaky porch about to knock on its door? To understand this, I guess I have to tell you about the local legend that haunted my childhood. The house started dying in 1971, simply meaning that about this time its caretaker no longer cared. The weeds had become the landscapers, draining all the beautiful colors to grow tall and strong, and the whispers of the disgruntled neighbors would grow strong as well, because their property value wasn't. And this idle gossip would turn into the eerie tale I heard growing up. By the time I was five in 1977, it was the scariest thing in my life, because my shithead older brother felt it was the most amusing thing ever to see the fear on my face the countless times he reminded me of this story. It was said that the house was purchased back in the 1950s by the newlyweds Liz and Sam Belly. Both were in their 20s, full of life, and became avid participants in the community. They were adored by everyone, and everyone knew they were extremely anxious to start their family. Except, as the years went by, the Bellies just never had any good news about a little one. But the couple remained positive, took care of themselves, followed some harmless old wives' tales. But life never grew inside Liz's womb. And as they entered their late 30s, the couple started to come to terms that it might not be in their cards to have a child. In respect for one another, they never did seek to find out which one of them might have been sterile. Commendable, except for husband Sam, not knowing left room for resentment to sneak in. It would get to a point as each passing year remained barren that the endless disappointment started showing in his eyes. To put it plainly, he blamed her. Petty arguments began sprouting over nothing, chipping away at their marriage, until finally, Liz couldn't recognize the man she married. She yearned for him though, the wonderful, thoughtful Sam that had been her everything all these years. But she wasn't blind. She simply was not making him happy anymore. And when you truly love someone, you only want to make them happy. It would be one last argument in 1965. She packed her things and before she walked out that door, she looked back at Sam sitting at the kitchen table and said, Goodbye, Sam. She couldn't help it, but she did hope that he would ask her to stay and she would have, but he didn't. He didn't even say goodbye. He didn't even bother to turn around. Now Sam would remain at 823 Ravenswood. People would see him leave for work and come home. Other than that, Sam would just be a silent wave, no longer a participating member of the neighborhood. Six years would pass. In 1971, Liz's sister, was kind enough to give Sam a call to let him know that Liz had passed away. A shock. She was only 43. How could this have happened? The sobbing voice on the other end admitted to Sam that Liz had never stopped loving him. Regardless of how it ended between them, her years with him were the best in her life. And even though she did remarry, it was a bit hasty, seeking the same happiness she lost, but it would be a mistake. He was bad for her, the relative explained. He was an alcoholic, and one night, Liz accidentally mentioned you. When he heard your name, he flew into a rage. He, be he beat her to death, Sam. 
Sam was gripping the phone so hard, his knuckles were white. Tears were streaming down his face as he was hyperventilating. The only other time he cried this hard was when Liz said her final goodbye and he just couldn't turn around. Liz's sister could hear that he was having a hard time speaking. She simply gave him the date of her funeral and said that the family would love that he be there because they know that Liz would want him to. And then she told him something that dropped Sam to his knees. She said, You could meet Liz's daughter. She's only three and she doesn't understand where mommy went. Sam's trembling voice said, Daughter? And dropped the receiver. That same night, Sam walked up the stairs and with each step, his heart grew heavier and heavier. Memories of Liz came back so vividly. Minor details such as momentary glances he would give her, only to find her already looking at him. He only realized now how much love was in her eyes for him. And with that, the guilt of how his accusatory stares would pain her. And to think... It was him the whole fucking time. It had always been him that lacked what they needed to create a family. He hung himself just above the bed they used to sleep in. His last thoughts were to find Liz in the afterlife so he could protect her, love her, lay out his entire soul for her. But there wouldn't be any redemption here. Instead, the moment he chose to take his own life, the moment his neck snapped, he found himself back in his bedroom, looking up at himself, hanging from the ceiling. The immense guilt, the heartache, were all now amplified and unmoving. His countenance would convey his very pain forever. This was his purgatory, to be trapped in this house, his memory, his hell, forever. And that was the story that so messed with my head about the house. So now let me take you to the day that would not allow me to take my long cut. My alarm rang in the morning, as it always does. I hit the five minute snooze, as I always do. Except... It wasn't snooze that I hit, I had hit the off switch. So I woke up late. We all know what that feels like, so I'll spare you the explanation. I exploded out of my house with 10 minutes left to get to school, running as my heavy backpack pulled me left to right. I know what you're thinking. Being late for school isn't that big a deal. But being locked out of class while everyone else was taking a test that was worth half my grade was. So, no long cut. As A23 neared, I ran to the opposite side of the street. I tried to implement tunnel vision as I ran by. But, as the house passed, my stupid rogue eyes, my curiosity, whatever it was, I shot a look at that damn house. And I swear on anything, I saw a man with the saddest face I'd ever seen looking directly at me from the upstairs window. Well, my mind went blank with fear, but thankfully, my legs did not betray me as my pace picked up dramatically. I got to school on time, but the man's face was with me with each and every problem I had to answer. Fortunately, I had studied hard and it was like clockwork for me. I passed with high marks. And for the remainder of the school day, the man's face haunted me. But when I entered the library, as I tend to do before I walk home, a bit of clarity came with the quiet. It wasn't a menacing look that he was giving me. It was a sad look. A look you would give a passerby to convey that you were, what, in need of help? 
But there was one pressing question I had to tackle first. Do I entertain that the scary story of my childhood is true? Look, it scared me to no end. Yes, that's true. But like how a good horror film would. You know it's not real. You change your underwear and you go on with your life. But this... <sighs> I knew what I had to do first, which for me was the unthinkable. The following day, I skipped school. I took the bus downtown and entered the county clerk's office with the ruse that I was doing a report on 823 Ravenswood. The clerk's eyes lit up, more than happy to oblige this documentary of the most famous house in our little town. I learned that a Samuel Bellevue bought the house in 1952. A mortgage was taken out with the credit union and according to the clerk, after the tragedy, there was absolutely zero interest in the house and the bank most likely just wrote the property off as a total loss. Well, even tall tales start with a little bit of truth now, doesn't it? Sam did exist. The rabbit hole was dug. So let's jump in. My next stop was just a few blocks down to the city library. This place saved everything. They had microfiche on periodicals, newspapers, even grocery ads, a plethora of articles acting like a time machine to the past. But because of this vast documentation, it was incredibly painstaking to pinpoint such a specific moment in time. I sat there for hours and I must tell you it felt so good when I finally found a piece of the puzzle that fit the lore. I found a picture of Sam Bellevue and his bride Elizabeth in a community paper dated back in 1952. The way Liz and Sam looked at each other, I believe the cameraman could not have captured a happier looking couple. The caption below it read, Welcoming these two lovebirds, Liz and Sam Bellevue, to the neighborhood. At this point, my heart began to hurt because this tragic love story began to enter reality. The moment I saw the picture, I knew I had seen Sam before. I had to adjust the smile to a frown, tack on 30 years, and it was the face through that window. I also found the public records that recorded the Bellevue's divorce in 1965. In the obituaries, I would find that Elizabeth was born in 1928 and had died in 1971 at the age of 43, leaving behind her three-year-old daughter, Sammy. My jaw dropped. She had named her daughter after Sam. She really never did stop loving him. If I were to be dramatic which I am, I would say that Sammy, in Liz's mind, was the child that she and Samuel were supposed to have. Fuck, 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 fuck. Okay, let's find Sam's obituary. This is where I hit a roadblock. I couldn't find it anywhere. Even if there wasn't an obituary for Sam, his suicide was the biggest news of the time and there should be at least something about it but nothing either sam did not pass in 1971 like the story goes or no, no. did sam ever die i sat back exhausted and then it hit me like a ton of bricks why a home that has been foreclosed on by a bank would still be standing in that terrible condition after all these years it hadn't been foreclosed on. Someone was keeping up with the payments. And now my head is all screwed up. Mainly because I knew what my logical next step was. Damn it. Now here I am. Standing on the worn creaky porch of 823 Ravenswood. This definitely was not a good idea. But I was 16. I wasn't yet seasoned enough to view this as a bad idea. Knock. Knock. When the faint echoes from within faded, it was still 
and quiet for what felt like a long time. Then I heard something dragging across the floor. The old house started to moan as whatever it was within made its way to the door. I inched back as I began to sense whatever it was opposite me behind this door inching closer. Then a click of the door latch, a twist of the knob. The door opened slightly and peeking around the door were the saddest eyes I've ever seen. Again.